Bound club. If you had a superpower, what would it be? The power to control microphones and cameras without having to touch them. I'd be the remote control. Thank you very much for joining us for an episode of Film Club. I'm one of your hosts, Andy Harrison. To my right, as always, it's the receiver, Andy Donaldson. Every single week in Film Club, we invite you along to watch a film with us. We dive into some of cinema's best for coming back here to talk it out. This week, though, we're changing things up a little bit. Andy, pretty soon, Infinity War um, has its sequel come out in the form of Endgame. So we need to talk about a particular genre. We need to talk about superhero genre because we have to figure out what's our definitive top 10 list. The one thing we need to talk about is you need to improve your jokes. But <laughs> nope. Jokes are top notch right now. We are going to talk about our top 10 superhero films. Andy's made a top five. I've made a top five. We've crossed them over a little bit. We've checked each other's list to make sure there's no duplicates. And who wants to start us off? Do you want to start us off? Or am I going to yeah, start us off? Yeah, so, so interesting. We're on about our favourite Marvel films, because obviously Marvel's big at the moment. I will put Guardians down as one of my favourite. However, it doesn't make this list. And the reason it doesn't make this list is I feel like it's, it's, it's not a superhero film. Um, it is heroes to some extent, but it's not super. It's not like with powers and stuff are, are officially super anyway. But the point is, the director. What? As a side note, what you're about to say is the only Marvel film from the MCU on this list. No, it's not. Anyway. Go on. Um, so, James Gunn, director. Yeah. Yeah. Super. He did a film with... Oh, I thought you had him in order. I do. Carry on. No, no. They're, Rain, they're listening. Rain Wilson, uh, Dwight from The Office. Imagine him as a want-to-be crime fighter. Yeah? And the best... <laughs> He's got Ellen Page as well, who plays his um, his buddy. Um, is the crim- Crimson Wen- uh, Wrench, sorry. And he basically, it's a story, uh, without giving it too much away, it's a story about how his girlfriend gets taken away by her old uh, drug dealer. Um, and he goes to fight crime and eventually goes to confront this guy. And the best quote in the entire film is, shut up, crime, like this. You haven't seen it, and I, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but please watch it. It's got such, such great humour. Very James Gunn, very kind of like... Indie, but like really well produced and everything like that. And uh, Rain Wilson, that's his name, isn't it? Incredible. It's, I, it's I basically, actually had no idea it was James Gunn. Oh my god, it's incredible. It's seriously, it's it's basically Dwight, touch more mature, but Dwight's personality. If Dwight became a superhero, while Ellen Page is following him around. Oh my god, Ellen Page is crazy good. <laughs> Ever um, crazy. Which actually, she's back in the scene at the moment with Umbrella Academy and superheroes, and just mm. kind of get, you know, um, get your pride too. She gets around the superhero genre. My first one is Batman 89. This is the Tim Burton Batman film. This is the film where people started taking... Is this the Penguin? So this is the one before the Penguin. This is the one with Jack Nicholson as the Joker. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, I need to watch him again, you know. This was the very first serious Batman film. We look at it today and we can see kind of the camp... Adam West is gone, you know, like the, the shark repellent spray, all that's kind of Previously, gone. Batman's reputation was in the gutter because yeah. of, like, Adam West. Superhero as a genre was not a thing yet. We'd only had, like, Richard Donner's Superman. And then we got um, Tim Burton's Batman. Tim Burton came along and brought Tim Burton's style to it and his, his gothic nature, which complemented Batman so wonderfully. It gave us this, like, iconic look of Gotham City which would go on to influence the Batman animated series, which would go on to influence like the games and even more of the comics and things. It's It came at the same time we had like the Dark Knight Returns coming out in comic book format. Mm. Comic books were growing up. It just, it, it sparked the exact right moment and really grew the genre from its grassroots before it became what it is today. Batman 89. Absolute knowledge. Go on. What's number What's number um, four for you? So number four is one that encompasses superheroes and quite a lot of them. And this is one of the great examples of a, a team of different power superheroes. So you can like kind of oh, I'd like to be like him. I'd like to be a him, which is the X Men. It's X Men First Class. But what this does really well, I was crossed between the two that he he's got the other one, is it it, it puts politics in, uh, into play. And it's really cool when superhero films do that because it's not just a case of, oh, look at this guy out there. He's got loads of powers like this. He's just going to fight this thing and it's, the whole world's going to ignore him. This is a case of, no, no, Nixon's president. He's mm-hmm. basically going to say, we're about to get rid of, you know, I'll go at war against superheroes. And it's a case of humans versus super, uh, mutants in their case. Um, 
and mutants versus mutants. It's almost like a little civil war in between them all. And everything just like complements each other really well. And it culminates in this amazing moment to it. You know, for those who haven't seen that, and it's been out ages, but this amazing moment that kind of like, it's such a it's such a big scene. It's basically you got like um what's his name um Professor X versus Magneto, and it just that that moment between them, great chemistry and as well. I love that it's not just like hypothetical Marvel universe politics; it's actually real, real world, world alternate yeah. history by yeah. by twisting the Cuban Missile Crisis, but really fucking well. Oh yeah, yeah. So first class, the best X Men film. Yeah, that includes Logan. Point that out there. So, um, number four for me is the most recent film on this list, I think, and it's Into the Spider-Verse. Oh, yes, it will be then. Into the Spider-Verse. I need to watch it. As far as I'm concerned right now, he says while thinking about it, is, for me, the best animated superhero film. That's what I've heard people say. It's, have you not seen it yet? No, I want to watch it. So don't spoil too much. Okay, I won't spoil anything because it is still relatively new. It's energetic. It's stylish. It's got a unique voice about it. It's it's forward facing. There are there are problems with it as well. I just want to put this out there. There are also big problems that a lot of people do not discuss with this film. It does character really well. It does action really well. It does uh, it uses its influence as as a comic book medium. Sorry, from comic book mediums to influence its own visual aesthetic. I remember seeing the trailer. It looks incredible. It's amazing. It's spectacular. Wow. It's ultimate. It's web of. It's friendly neighborhood. It's Spider-Man. It's through and through this film of Spider-Man. You get this, it's not even because of this weird, like, um, fetishistic way of, like, looking at the different suits. It's not even because of that. If you remove all that stuff, it's still a stunningly beautiful piece of work which has unique animation styles to it. It's a way of, like, they animate the characters on twos, but the background's on ones. And it makes such a beautiful film. There we go. You're on strike two for shit jokes. Oh, there'll be more. So, my third choice is The Incredibles. This is Disney's way of saying, yeah, we're going to do a superhero film. And my God, do they do it well. A family of superheroes. So, uh, much like First Class was politics of superheroes, this is how to be a family with superheroes. How do you have an everyday, you know, nine to five job uh, when you're a big, strong, hulking man? You're basically Superman, sort of thing that can't fly. Um, you, 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 Previous history, you know, superheroes have been outlawed. So how do you just crack on like with a day? It's about finding yourself. I know we've we've had a conversation in the past about like what would it be like? You know, have a superhero where um, it's just a modern person that had to like live as a normal person, like the girl film you're on about doing. Um, and I really like this in The Incredibles. I like how it, obviously at the end it becomes like a massive superhero kind of thing, and they all come together and work as a team. But it's just the it's the nine to five ness of it. It's the you know the mom and the kids, you know. <laughs> what's his flash has to do like racing it's like you know slow down like this you can't just run all the time you know a violet the, the dash dash sorry not flash yeah flash sorry dash uh you've got violet who's like dealing with guy problems and stuff like that um you got jack jack who's you know getting powers and then one of the best characters of any marvel uh, marvel pixar film which is edna who is just unreal so um i just think this is a real feel good film uh, feel good film it's great for adults it's great for kids and um, it, it came out at the right time in the superhero like kind of moment, and I just think it's great. It's also a lovely commentary on the genre a little bit. Yeah. In the, like, it's, I love those, the opening sequence where it's all uh, rose-tinted, golden yes. age, yeah. looking back on yeah. the, you know, the prime of superheroes. Oh, where he's going through all the different superheroes, and it's like capes and the old, yeah. you know, the capes and stuff like that. Great film. It's great. Um, so my number three, I'm willing to bet, is a controversial one in the audience, and that's Watchmen. Now, we both kind of agree that this Watchmen should be on the list somewhere. Um, but I know that Zack Snyder right now is having his reputation like dredged through the mud. I would always consider Watchmen the best Zack Snyder film. I would. And I think Just, it's, it's yeah. arguably the last good film that he made. Was this before or after 300? This is after 300. Yeah, okay, yeah, I agree then. I after agree. this, he would go on to make um, Sucker Punch. And then he I'm would do it. Man of Steel, which you know, the first two thirds are really good. And then yeah, I, yeah. I um, Let's destroy City. Watchmen is has the benefit of resting on the laurels of one of the best comic books ever written, deconstructing the superhero. Yeah, and asking if somebody's going to be a superhero, what does it take to be that person? For ethics and everything like that, isn't it? What, yeah. yeah. What ethics does that person have? Mm. What political view does that person have? 
What sexual desires does that person have? And all of that gets played out through these individual mirrors of characters where they hold up uh, like this, this reflection of that particular aspect of being a superhero. And they just have this sort of commentary on it. It's this thorough commentary on these people who aren't inherently heroes. And they're not inherently good. And what happens when one of them's corrupt? And what happens when there is, in amongst all that, one person who has an unshakable moral compass yep. but doesn't necessarily have the power yep. to do something about that, and then there's somebody on the other side of it. Yep. Watchmen is a stunning piece of work adapted very faithfully by Zack Snyder and I think is, as time goes on, is being miscredited because it should be considered a better film than it is. I think one of the best things about Watchmen is much like first class it deals with politics as well it does an alternative universe of like you know real life alternative uh, future or like history whatever yeah it's where Nixon's got an additional term yeah yeah but my point is um it's its own universe like in the comics and this it's own universe it doesn't have any of the other superheroes coming in and out and stuff like that uh, and the other I know they're making a tv series with the HBO which I am looking forward to HBO but you look at First Class, and I, di- I like Days of Future Past, but then you look at Apocalypse. Mm. The the First Class is ruined by the fact that its sequels are like not as good and or shit if it's Apocalypse, because that was wank. Yeah, um, Watchmen gets to be its own contained. Exactly, element. exactly. And it's just a really good start, really good end, and it's that. Yeah. That, for me, is my favourite thing about it. Mm, I completely agree. So, number two. Kick-Ass. Kick-Ass. Many different reasons. I think it's a really good, like, turn around on the superhero genre and be like, you know what, we're just going to take the mick out of ourselves here. You have two Matthew Vaughan films on your list. Who's the other Matthew Vaughan? First Class. Oh, shit. Oh, shit, yeah. Interesting, interesting. Well played, Matthew Vaughan. Yeah, and I think it's really good. The other, I think one of the main factors, and I want to say this is a bit bit biased on my part, one of the major factors about Kick-Ass is John Murphy, the, the um <laughs> Oh, it's so good, though. Yeah, I know, I know. He does... He uses what's it called again? He uses uh, Adagio and D minor, yeah. which he uses for Sunshine. Uh, so John Murphy is the, the composer who did Sunshine, collaborated with Underworld. Um, incredible score, um, and he kind of like recycles some of that content for Kick Ass, and you have that amazing moment. It was like, uh, what's his name? Uh, Nicholas Cage is going Kryptonite and stuff like that, and you have the, the, the Adagio and D minor going up like this, and it's just an incredible scene. Uh, but in amongst all that, you got like um, a kind of you got like how to deal with teenage life, how to maintain a girlfriend. You know, you got this. Girl who's just got this, uh, what's her name? It's the, it's one of the, it's when she became famous. What's her name? The girl. Um, okay, um, Chloe Grace Moretz. That's the one. Uh, she's like, you know, that's the start of her career almost. And um, it's just really cool how it all comes together. And it's it's silly. It's silly, it's daft, and it takes a make out itself, but it's still a good fucking film. You still enjoy it. You still watch it. And she's like, you know what? Fucking glad I watched that. Even yep. if you've seen it for like the fifth time or something. It's the closest thing the superhero genre has to a real solid, good parody. Yeah, but a really good parody. It's got a good story. It's almost a parody that turns into a pastiche. Have you ever yeah, read yeah, it? Yeah. Uh, no, but I, I, yeah, I, I will at some point. Maybe. It's good. I'll lend you it. Cool. Um, number two for me, and it's heartbreaking somewhat to put it at number two. It's Spider-Man 2. Right now, the world is turning on Sam Raimi in an unjust Why? manner. Because this, those Spider-Man films are not part of the MCU, and currently it's cool to shit on things which are earnest and hokey. And that's exactly what Sam Raimi did. Sam Raimi basically adapts like the 1960s version of Spider-Man, not the contemporary version like of Spider-Man. And this is, I was, I was talking to somebody else about this earlier, and I described it as being, this is like if The Evil Dead was made in the early years of the horror genre. Yeah. This is yeah. the early dead of superhero, sorry, yeah. the evil dead of um, superhero films yeah. where it's it's campy, it's self-aware, but it's through and through a superhero film. At the moment, films, superhero films are forgetting that they are superhero films. This is the most superheroic film there has ever been. I, up until we reviewed it again, Spider-Man, it's in our first year film club, I felt that way. I felt like Spider-Man, Sam Raimi and stuff like that. I like Sam Raimi, to be fair, but I was like Spider-Man. Um, I get what you mean now. It is self-aware, it's campy, and for good reason, because, you know, as you said, early days, mm-hmm. still not huge in Tobey Maguire. But, but yeah. this, I think but this is the here, best. So this, this, do you remember when we were talking about in Spider-Man 1? This is what I love about Spider-Man 2, is that we no longer have to think of him as a high school student. Yeah, He's yeah, now yeah, an adult. Yeah, yeah. He's been an adult for ages. But 
Doctor Octopus is class in this as well. One of the best villains yeah, ever. Yeah, fantastic. fantastic. Has, it has one of the best action sequences of yeah. any superhero film on the train. It has one of the most yes. emotionally resonant, heroic acts in any superhero film, which is when he saves those people on the train. Yeah. And then everyone agrees, you know, we're not going to stare at empty. It's just through and through, if I could, if I could just replace Kirsten Dunst. <laughs> if I could just get rid of her weird little teeth. Or Tobey Maguire. And... I'd put more teeth into Tobey Maguire instead. That is harsh for you, Andy. So, moving That's on. very harsh. What is your number one? Struggled. Um, it was between Captain America, the first Avenger, or this. Um, and it had to come down to Iron Man. Because as I was saying to you, every time I think of a super film, a Marvel film in particular, or even the later DC films, which aren't as good in comparison, um, I can't help but look back on Iron Man where it's all started. And the reason for that is you look at it. it set, they paved the way for amazing... Um, you know, like kind of plot storyline that many other films would uh, recreate, but not as good, um, obviously with the exception of Captain America. And it's the idea of like the underdog, like a guy who's either starts off really well or starts off not so well, but picks up his power. And you see that, that kind of curve of power over time. Um, you, you see in this case, you see Tony Stark, you know, he's got everything, but then he gets kidnapped. And one by one, he builds his arm. And I love how the whole series of Iron Man, whilst his sequels might not be as good, and the My Avengers, you know, like whether or not they're as good, you know, it's I, I, you can argue over that. But each time he sees suit upgrade and upgrade, upgrade, because he's an artificial superhero. And that's what I really like about it. To contrast what I said earlier about Guardians of the Galaxy, where they are a bunch of misfits, not exactly superheroes, because they haven't got powers or anything like that. Tony Stark's almost a superhero because he's well, he's incredibly intelligent for one thing, but he made his own superpower and you see all those evolutions of his suit, but it starts and it comes down to that moment in that cave where he makes that, you know, instead of making those bombs for the for the guys, he's like, ah, fuck that, I want to make my own armor and get out of here. And he gets out of there. His development as a character becomes from a guy that sells weapons to um, you know, to everyone around the world, to someone who wants to go against that. And at the end you've got one of the best scenes ever. It's like, yeah, fuck it. I am Iron Man. Sorry, I need to say Spider Man then, Superman. Um, <laughs> I am Iron Man. It just, it's the one film I always go back to and think, I want to watch that again. And not forgetting, it has this incredible legacy of not being a film which should have existed. Like Marvel coming out and being like, let's make films. They'd had to go through this, like, this, this bankruptcy issue in the 90s. They'd had to sell off, like, the Fantastic Four and Spider Man to so, uh, X Men. So they, they, and Sony. And they, so they didn't have. Their, their their lead characters. Their, you said Iron Man was massively characters. huge before. No, this. no one, no one and outside Robin of Julian, comics way, really cared about Iron Man. Yeah. Like even in even in the comics, Iron Man was still kind of like I don't know, B tier character. He was, yeah, he was good, but like yeah. he wasn't Spider Man. He wasn't X Men. But now you look at him like and the Iron Man's probably the most famous one. They forced them to make like the, this idea of the MCU. It forced them to put their eggs onto Iron Man. And in doing that, it gave him freedom. But then on top of it, that film didn't even have a script when they were making what? it. They kept rewriting what? things at the very last minute. Like there's, there's little interviews of people where you talk about like, um, what, uh, what's he called? Uh, Jeff Bridges. Yeah. Jeff Bridges was talking about how like he found the first Iron Man very difficult to make because he wasn't very good at improv. And Robert Downey Jr. Would, be, is it? Robert Downey Jr. would work with him and like try and help him through the improv sequences what, so, and stuff. Uh, Robert, Robert Downey Jr. would like kind of help progress all that kind of like story forward and like, well, from his own improv and his own... We don't know the specifics, obviously, because we weren't on set. Well, but then, okay. um, then Obadiah Stane was originally meant to survive. And at first, Jeff Bridges was like, oh, like, thank God, like, I'm, I'm a little bit worried about characters. I, I, I can't get into this. But then as he, as he workshopped the whole thing, and as he started to enjoy the process, they turned around and told him that actually uh, your character's going to die. <laughs> and he was like, oh, no! <laughs> um, uh, yeah, you've you got to give credit to um, director John Favreau. Favreau. Yeah, John Favreau. Um, who who stars in it as well? Really good uh, director, actor sort of thing, and it's a minor role and everything like that. But it's the forefront of Marvel. And then at the top of my list, our number one, which I think maybe might have been your number one as well. I'm not sure if we will not discuss Up that. There. The Dark Knight. Up there. Like I know on your list, you maybe summarised it better because you had the Dark Knight trilogy, and that's exactly what this is. This list could have easily have been um, for me, Dark Knight. Batman Begins and Dark Knight Rises, like, and it was it was this restraint of making sure that I didn't want to just flood it with the same franchises. And for me, the Dark Knight, I think for lots of people out there, the Dark Knight is the film which will probably go down in history for many many years as the pinnacle of the genre. I didn't used to. I was a bit of a hipster. I didn't like not didn't like. I hadn't seen Dark Knight in ages, and I was like, why does everyone like it? I like the others better. Then I watched it again twice since that statement. It was only about a year ago, and I thought, oh, shit, that's why it's so good. Yep. There's many you, different factors. You bring together Christopher Nolan as this thoroughly auteur director. 
He brings in uh, Hans Zimmer to do the score. He Incredible marries up score. this this performance, this performance by Christian Bale, which is arguably the best Batman performance. Marries that alongside Heath Ledger's Joker. This tightly woven script, which has a very strong thematic core. You've got Wally Fister doing some of the best work he's ever done in cinematography. The film is arguably Christopher Nolan's best film. And we were saying before how it comes out with more superhero films have a quite a lot of them. A lot of them are quite binary. It's like a, a win or a loss, um, everything like that. More so win, pretty much ninety percent of the time. This is neither. This is the uh, one of the few that has a middle ground. This basically says it's a bit what I liked about uh, actually I won't say that like, spoilers. Um, but what this does is it's basically it's not a case of you save them both. You only save one of them, and that's insane. Or like when they're on the boats, it's just like. Yeah, yeah. Plays, plays with moral grey area. It has the benefit of really getting to well be done. a second part of a three arc, um, three act trilogy, and I think it will go down in history as being a stunning piece of work. Great film and practical effects. Um, honorable mentions I want to throw out there. I think Logan serves at least an honorable mention. I hate the finale of it, but it serves an honorable mention here. Um, some of the early X Men films, what they did for the genre, yeah, yeah. the Richard Donner Superman film, yeah, like. Anymore. And also Captain America, as I mentioned, the first Avenger. Captain America. And even I love some people love Infinity War. I know you don't. I do. <laughs> so there's also this thing that theoretically, maybe we've done this whole list like three weeks early and Endgame's going to end up being on this list. But, but yeah. if you're from the future, we are in the lonely past that doesn't have an Endgame yet. So let us know in the comments below what your top five, top ten superhero films are. And if you've seen Endgame... Let us know what you thought of Endgame down below. But maybe, like, kind of put a spoiler tag on it. Oh, yeah. Don't spoil it for us. Don't be that guy. Until next week, get watching.